Well, hey there, and welcome to the Homer Hangout Live. Hope you're doing well. How has your week been? Let me know in the chat. Good to see everybody here. Got a cool conversation to have with you today, all about first-time user experience. So if you don't know what that is, uh, that is coming up real quick before I get into things. Come and join us on the Discord. Tell me about what is going on with you in your game dev. If you've got any questions about Homer or Homer Publishing, do let me know over there. The link is in the description and you can scan the screen as we are watching it now. That didn't make any sense, but you know what I mean. And of course, if you want to publish your game with us, come and test your game inside Homer Lab. You'll find lots of tools in there and lots of goodies inside the academy to help you on your journey as a game dev. So there we go. Like I said, cool conversation today. Hope you're going to get something out of it. If you've got any questions, as always, do let me know in the chat. Tell me where you're from, if you're here live, and if you're on the replay, be sure to leave us a comment. And of course, hit the like and subscribe if you want to stay up to date with everything we're doing here on the channel and support us that way. It lets us know that we're doing something that you like to see. All right, I'm going to jump straight into it. What is up, everybody, in the chat there? I have got a fly buzzing around me here, which is super annoying already. Uh, what is up there, you do? What is up, a video? <laughs> there, I get your name wrong every single time. I'm quite proud of it at this point. Uh, what is up? What is up, Jenny? What is up, Colette? What is up, everyone? Ray, what is up? Good to see you all here in the chat. Okay. Well, I say you can't see the comments, but I appreciate that. All right, let's jump into things today. Let's get going. Um, all right, so let us jump straight into this. So we are talking about uh, a game design subject today, and this is all about the first time user experience. <laughs> what an amazing start. The first time user experience or the FTUE. Now you're going to hear me say that a lot today. Um, so get familiar with the acronym in there. So let's just jump straight into it right now and uh, let's figure out what we're talking about. So what is the first time user experience? I'm sure as uh, experienced game devs, you'll know about this, but I want to highlight this for for a few reasons today and why I think it's important. Um, essentially, it can influence your game design in terms of features and getting you to think about what is actually going on in your game. And that might sound like a kind of a weird thing to say, but by really concentrating on the first time user experience can really shape and mold your game into potentially different directions or at least get you thinking about the whole aspect of this that you might not have considered. You might get lost in your game mechanics and controls and everything, um, but I want to highlight this to make sure you know the importance of this. And I think we've all got experience of when we first go to a website or we first get a product, that very first few minutes of whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're browsing on a website or opening a box, you know, from, from Apple and all of that kind of stuff, it really does have um, an impact on how the user feels about what it is that they're doing. So in terms of free to play, obviously with a free download, the competition is ridiculously steep. So we have a gazillion apps in the App Store. Um, no barrier to entry for downloading. You just hit install and off you go. So our job here is to ensure that we're giving our players, our first-time players, the best experience possible. And hopefully that indeed will keep them around longer and thus raise the retention rates in our games. So it's very crucial to not neglect this. Um, you can see on the screen there, I've put some stuff up there. We can see survivor.io here, uh, the opening to that, a wild success, of course. Um, but it, I think it really displays it nicely, the fact that the first time you turn this on, you're greeted with that. Now, obviously, um, it can be as elaborate as an animation or a sequence here. Um, but there are various things that are definitely achievable um, if you don't want to go all out on things like this. It's 
every player, like I say on the slide there, every player starts your game at the same point. They are day one, minute one. So it's our job here to look at some of the things that we can do to try and keep them around as long as possible. Now, of course, it always depends on the game. Um, and your main consideration should always be making your game as playable and as fun as possible. Dial in the controls and the mechanics, get everything super, super nice on that. But this is one aspect of it that I think it should be interesting for you to consider when building your game. So if you're not straying too far from the beaten track, people will have played similar games to yours. Uh, that's not a bad thing at all. Uh, it proves market validation. Uh, we don't want to go way out there creating something super wacky that no one can understand. But even if your game is similar, yours will have a difference. If it, if it stands to do well, it will have a difference. So it's still worth thinking about this, even if you're potentially, say you're doing a runner, everyone or a lot of people are very familiar with runners, um, but you still need to pay attention to this. All right. So got any questions, do get them in the chat. I can see the chat, of course. Uh, it's not on the screen today. Uh, it wasn't last week, but it's not on the screen today, but get them in and I will address them at the end. Okay. So the first time user experience is exactly, it sets the tone, the feel and the expectations of the product. The players need to know what it is and how they are going to interact with it. All right, so I took this quote from the best-selling book, Design for Emotion, which I'd highly recommend. And Aaron Walter, the author there, says, why do we sell for usable interfaces when we can make them both usable and pleasurable? And I think this is a really key aspect to this. Um, we can elevate our experience through the UI of course it's an essential part but we don't just have to make it dull we can go that extra mile um, and really try and think about how we can influence the player further by some strategic stuff that we're going to cover a bit later so this is our take the best first time user experience will feel frictionless exciting and empowering but the worst ones can leave the player just totally frustrated and almost certainly will bail and your attention will tank and we've all had those games where we've opened it up and it's like what is this or we've got a thousand boxes and we're chasing that yellow arrow around the screen trying to shut the tutorial off because we just don't care and ultimately we will just bail out there and and just completely just shut it down and never come back so it's pretty significant we've got monopoly go from scopely here obviously uh crushing it right now still getting uh still topping the charts getting tons of downloads and i highly recommend you go and check out their their i'm gonna call it onboarding for now but we'll we'll see the difference in a moment but um the first few minutes of that game are exquisitely done in terms of onboarding you through the controls and the game making it super fun without you you don't feel like you're being taught to you don't feel like you're learning um and it whizzes you through and makes it super fun but we'll we'll get onto that so frictionless and fun is a good way to think about it all right so as I just mentioned, you would have heard the term of onboarding before, um, game onboarding or player onboarding. And the essential sort of requisite for that um, is what is the game? How do I do stuff? And why am I doing it? And it's always a zero death scenario. So when we put the player into the game, we make sure that they can't die and they can, they can run around or whatever the game type you're doing. It's super important that they can just run around and not die. Okay. Simple control instructions to get them moving. Don't bombard them with too much stuff. And make it super clear of the first action 
that you want the player to make or the or what the player must do first so we've got a uh, dreamdale from say games huge game right now um super super great game from them um it does it a little bit disservice from the way i've chopped the uh the image here that you're looking at uh, this is just the very start of the game um the opening moments so the first time user experience is way longer than this but you can see on that as a minimal requirement it shows us the joystick control gives us a little pop-up that we need to save the princess gives us a little bit of context with the baddie sort of stealing her away and then we run up with to towards the arrow to show us where we go now that is a classic onboarding which we'd see in the hyper casual but now when we're looking for more mature and bigger titles um we want to be doing better quite frankly we we can do better and by thinking about uh, the stuff we're going to go through today i think it will make your games overall much better indeed now that's a really basic way of putting it but that is the gist of of what we're going to cover today so I hope all that makes sense. I know you are a very uh, experienced crowd here, so I don't want to uh, teach you how to suck eggs, as they say. Uh, but I just wanted to make that clear that that's what we're talking about. We know the minimal onboarding, but this is how do we how do we elevate it so we're up in our production value and ultimately creating better games, right? So I put together here a typical fictional this is not a real uh retention chart but just so we're all clear again i know you all you uh lovely folks know about retention and how it works but essentially this is what we're trying to improve upon we have a thousand people install the game on day zero how many of those thousand people come back the following day and that is how you work out your day one retention and that is the number that we really want we want as many people to come back the next day as possible and of course as i mentioned there this is not the only kpi that we track but retention is a key one and it's something that we need to master as much as we can and implement all different little things that can influence our players to come back the following day again this will always it will always come back to the point of how well you've crafted your game and the core loop but it is certainly an effect of first time onboarding or first time user experience that can influence how the player feels and whether or not they are likely to return so there we go i thought this was really cool and this was a survey from google last year um global mobile game player survey just short of 24 well just over 23,000 players were surveyed all 18 plus and they primarily play games on their mobile so they're not your classic gamer whatever that means these days but i think we should go down some of these because this is the sort of thing where we're starting to get into the the nuts and bolts of this and i think looking at the results of this survey really can indicate to you what the things we need to avoid or improve upon so weirdly number one 39 percent don't come back why they quit is because it's not fun and that's such a loose and broad brushstroke term it's very difficult right now to understand what that means but we all have our own idea of fun we've covered this before a few times what's fun for me might not be fun for you um but that is the top answer you know the family fortunes number one answer i didn't i, I quit because it wasn't fun so i think in a way as as well as number two uh with too many ads i think we can almost discard those 
as kind of fluffy answers because obviously you only have to read any reviews of any free-to-play game that monetizes through ads that the biggest complaint, the one stars come, too many ads. And of course they have a point, but it doesn't help us that much in terms of trying to craft our experiences better. I think the number, the third one on this list here is too many bugs and glitches. And I think this really should hammer home to you, if nothing else today. I'll be disappointed if that's the only thing. But crashes and bugs are right up there, three and four of why people crit. So if your game is bugging out or glitchy, people won't stand for it because there's so many other things that they could be doing. So be sure to test your game. Make sure that there's there's that little glitch that happens every now and again. Just go, ah, fix it. You know, we need bug-free products. Um, of course, there are things that uh, always come up that you'd never... Some random player does some random combo that bl uh, blows your game up. Um, that's a fly. That's fair enough uh, in a way, but let's uh, get rid of the bugs. Next up was play to win. So sorry about this fly. It's driving me mad. Um, that is a, a bugbear, of course, from a lot of players. But here it starts to get super interesting for me. So 29%, percent, <laughs> I'll put my teeth back in, 29%, just under a third, bail because it takes too long to progress and i think that's a really key one so let's just say a third for argument say a third of players will quit your game if they're not progressing fast enough so this is where we can start looking at like okay what is the pace of my game am i holding back too much am i not front loading my content enough to make sure that all that great stuff that i built Everyone is quitting before they even get to it. So that was a really interesting one. Uh, the cost too much to progress is almost pay to win. Too difficult is another one. And I think uh, Hyper Casual solved this in a, in a big way uh, of being the non-punitive games where we make it relatively easy. Uh, but again, you need to really think about the difficulty levels of your game and the type of game that you're building and try and match that difficulty level with it. If you're playing a rage game, obviously it's going to be super hard and that is uh, at, the, at the heart of that rage sort of genre. But for what the games we're sort of building, you need to fine tune the, the balance in there of the difficulty levels and something you need to think about in terms of how do I get them through the game a little bit faster and maybe like nerf the 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 sort of first few levels to get them flowing, make it easy, uh, easier, uh, and all this kind of stuff. So I of of, of course uh, the slides here will be available inside the academy uh, on Tuesday because uh, we have a, a bank holiday here in the UK, but it, uh, Tuesday morning, they will be inside the academy. So come back to this one because um, I think it's important. Last two on this list is they start playing another game. So they just like, they just bail because, um, and that again, a quarter of your players will just bail because uh, they, they've started another game and that's more their jam. Um, and the other one and the last one, which I think was kind of fun, is the fact that uh, people are, are obviously being self-aware and getting slightly too addicted to the games, um, which I think um, is a high percentage of people, again, just under a quarter of people will stop playing it because it's taken over. So um, I think that is pretty interesting indeed. All right, what is up, Geek Nora? Good to see you. I will get to the comments afterwards. I want to make sure we play on because I've got a bit to cover here. Uh, let me just get over here. All right. So six key ways to level up your first time user experience. Let's go. Another bit of chart for you. And I thought this was even better. So same survey from Google this time. 
But what keeps them motivated? So we just saw the, the reasons why they bail. Too many ads, crashes, glitches, all the sort of common ones that you'd expect. So let's look now at what people keeps them interested. Again, just over 23,000 global mobile first gamers here. So this is target audience, super duper, right? Gameplay is fun. Of course, heads up the list here, over 51% or 51%, over half, just. Um, same reasoning before. It wasn't fun, so I bailed. It is fun, so I keep playing it. I think this one is very difficult to nail down. So let's just start and nudge our way towards the bottom here. So engaging story, 40% of these people surveys, and it was a big data set, 23,000. Engaging story, which I think is really kind of interesting and something I hadn't considered. The right level of challenge, and that is really what I was just saying about um, on the last uh, view of when people were bailing, it's getting that balance right. So they're, they're mirroring each other somewhat here. But without the right level of challenge, 38% of people are keeping in your game because they feel it is. And I think from years ago, the original Angry Birds somehow managed to do this so, so well. As it just as you're just about to throw the phone out the window because you couldn't do that level, somehow magically you got through that level and they just find find that biting point as you, as, as you like. Just that, that, that pinch point of where it's just starting to get wildly frustrating, you somehow got through it. Whether or not that was calculated within the, within the game, I'm not sure. Whether if you had 25 goes or something, it kind of cheated for you, like stealthily, sneaky-deaky somehow. Not sure it was that intelligent. But the point is... It's that right level of challenge. Um, so both charts showed how important that is. The social aspect comes in next, 35%. Uh, something certainly when we're looking at prototypes, um, probably not going to get involved in. So I think we can ignore that. And the next two, again, lots of content to explore and lots to improve or level up, which kind of goes hand in hand with each other. But... Again, just under a third, well, just over a third on content and just under a third on leveling up and progression. So I think that is super important to think about here as we move away from the hyper casual games. Um, your content strategy, or at least your leveling up and content strategy, really needs to come into this. Of course, we don't necessarily need to have it all dialed in to do the test but the structure and the vision and a game design document that shows where you're exploring doesn't have to be over an elaborate but you need to be baking these thoughts into your overall game design rather than just putting out a playable level as we've seen in the past Alrighty, not pay to win we saw that before regular updates which is a a, a really interesting one which I think uh, shouldn't surprise too many people when you've got a good game that you want to keep hitting them with content and, and updates. I think live ops have really come into their own, which almost count as an update these days, I would say, where there's constantly new things going on. Uh, live ops especially can be super powerful. I know um, Monopoly Go just run their first live op over the last week and it literally skyrocketed both their sales and engagement there is a post i will link to on the discord which i can't quite recall i think it was from game refinery today um and it really just the it just took it to the moon completely um multiplayer again something that we wouldn't be too concerned about unless we're doing fake multiplayer and a lot to collect that's slightly different to content and improve, but lots of stuff to collect is still just under a third of people stick around because of that. 
So I, I hope you agree with me that this is kind of a powerful chart. Um, of course, it's not a hundred and there are different things that you need to consider and it will differ slightly from the games that you're building. But this is a big data set of data from Google telling us what the players are saying. So I think you should really pay attention to this um, as the main key triggers of what's keeping people around. So in terms of your first time user experience, um, I think these are the three positive pillars that you should really go by when we're thinking to leveling up our onboarding and really trying to keep our players super engaged from, from the moment they launch your game. So we have learning, discovery, and motivation. Now, they're the top three pillars, and these are completely interchangeable at all times, and they connect together, which is a really way, uh, weird way of putting it, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. All of these merge and combine are completely fluid with each other. It's not one thing or another. It's not in this order or that order. It's all of these things combined or some of these things combined that will really capture your players' attention and pull them in and give them a positive experience from day one. So learning, this is the teaching of the controls, uh, the game rules, but of course it needs to be done in context with your game and all of these tasks and the learning aspect of this needs to have meaning. So don't just say uh, run over here, like get them to run over there and pick up a coin. Make sense? Are they doing a puzzle? Well, if your first level is like a simple puzzle game, why don't you get them to put the last piece of the puzzle in and then all of a sudden they know the controls, they know the win state, and they get rewarded immediately for doing that. Just these little tweaks to think about and it, all, it will all change depending on your type of game. The discovery aspect is just like removing any friction at all. Let the player engage with your game. Don't give them, like we go back to the simple onboarding where it's at zero death. Let them explore a little bit. Um, give them something to make them smile and delight them when, they, when they're running about. Oh, it's cool to do this, right? And if you can, add some kind of emotion in there, uh, which goes hand in hand with the delight aspect, but to ensure that it's kind of like, it's it's so hard to articulate because it will depend on what you're doing. But is there some way that you can make them feel like they've made a really good decision for trying out your game? And the last one here is motivation. And I'm really, really big on this. You've probably heard me talk about this at all, but giving rewards away early on is such a powerful a motivator to keep people engaged with your game and make them feel that they've won without doing anything. I think that's really, really important. You can have small little challenges that rewards them well. It can be teasing of what's coming up next. You know, show them. We see this in, uh, we saw this in Hyper Casual uh, as a real basic level where we would start the level at the end and zoom back with the camera. That is teasing future stuff, but it's these small things that are, are little tricks that are really powerful. That when you when when you do things like that, you you you, wow. When you do things like that. You really have to understand that that's a motivating factor here, that the player, even if they don't consciously think it, they want to get to the end because they've already seen it. Um, and of course, player agency, which uh, is super important to let the player give them choices, make them feel like they're driving it, um, and let them, let them be the hero. Let them make the decision. Give them a choice. Uh, as much as you can. So that's the overall framework of the pillars here. Again, 
take this bit from that. You can't see my hand. Take this bit from that bit and swap them around. But I think this one is really kind of important to come back to also to try and keep yourselves on track here and make sure that you're keeping within this stuff when you're building out your first level and you don't make it an afterthought. Okay, so this is from the six pillars, uh, from the three pillars, here's six ways, and I've tried to do it so they're kind of achievable at whatever studio size you have. Um, if you're a solo dev or if you're a bigger team, I think at this point, um, all of these or some of these or most of these or one of these is achievable to really take you to the next level here. Start leveling yourself up. Market's going to need it. You're going to need to do it. And these are some simple ways, six ways to choose from, or all of them or any of them, to level up your first-time user experience and, I believe, your game design as well as you start thinking about how you could implement some of this stuff. Enable players to express their personalities. Show players what your um what makes your game great add open loops and narrative if you can and i i'm sure you can even in the uh weirdest non-story driven game you can um make your first time user experience worthwhile juicy and rewarding which i've just been talking about balance the pace and the hand holding which is guiding them through with the fun you know don't make a boring onboarding peak curiosity with short medium and long-term goals slash objectives to show them what's coming up and really peak their curiosity and interest so let's go through some of the other things one by one here so enable players to express their personalities this is a simple trick that you can do um, and let the player choose your character. Now, most games, aside from some puzzles, I would think would be the biggest one. You don't really have characters. Uh, but if you've got a character-based game, let the player choose the character. So this could be the gender, the color, the skin, the tool, the vehicle. But we can see here uh, from Nono Islands, got a, a Game Editors Award from Apple this game. We can choose our adventurer there. So just two different ones. We have a girl and a boy on this uh, example. But immediately, I, I'm, I, as a player, I can make that decision and I feel like I, I'm, that, I'm slightly more invested than I would be if I just start off the game. Now, this could be a really simple thing to implement into your game, uh, but it just, it just elevates it one step further. So all, immediately, I've got a decision. I've got some agency to choose what I want. Who's going to be the hero? I'm going to choose this one or that one. And immediately, I feel like I'm a little bit more involved without doing very little at all. And again, this could be anything you want, uh, depending on your game type. Uh, the naming of characters that goes hand in hand with this one, it's kind of a curious one. You know, we've all had the games where it says, oh, you know, uh, enter your name. And it's very, very unlikely at this point that people will bail to enter their name. But if you name your character immediately you're that bit further invested than you were before uh, if you have a game map you could um, let them choose the first location so you could put them on that and you could give them a split in the map can you see my hands the split in the map and let them choose should we go this way or that way now depending on the map and the graphics you can totally fake this by having the same first level in your game but you just show them uh, two options, two options at the start, but they both point to the same one. So whichever one they choose, they can still go to the to the same one that you've built. So you don't have to build another level, but it gives the player the option to say, right, I'm going this way, or I'm going that way, or which way do I go? I think that's a really powerful one without doing much work at all. Any option to add choices in the beginning, I think should be leveraged. So like I said, with that map, if you've got any other thing in your game and it will be specific to your game type and the one you're building, what can you do to say, right, can we do this or that to give them a choice at the start of their game and that will help? 
All right. Show players what makes your game great. Now, we're seeing Jurassic World Alive here from Ludia. Um, super high-end game, by the way. Um, but this one shows how their loading screen, and I think this is definitely one that you can adapt that shouldn't cost too much time, effort, or money, depending on your game, is that you can create a really high quality loading screen when your when your game's loading, right? So instead of just the typical rubbish old black screen with the Unity thing, you can whilst uh, add another layer onto it and give yourself a logo and a loading bar. So immediately when you see those games, you're like, oh, hello. Not just like blur, you're in. So it's that really small little thing. Once you've got it coded in, you can drop that in every project, just swap out the image or the sprite and go as elaborate or as, as, as basic as you want here. But it just shows that you're making a little bit more effort. And I think that's a really simple one, like the lowest one that you should be doing here. Um, if you can, start on the onboarding as showing the best parts of your game. Now, this can be tricky to implement. Uh, there's no one shoe, one shoe, one size fits all solution here. Um, it will differ on your game. But on that first level, maybe you could add a big boss or something that um, shows the player what is making your game so great. Um, you nerf it so he can't die. But then they get a feel of like, oh, wow, this looks amazing. Uh, let's play some more. Now, on uh, Jurassic World Alive here... Um, they they do basically they show you all the cars that you can collect, uh, which is a great example. But they really show off their unique selling point because they utilize Google Maps for the main gameplay, where you go around and find dinosaurs and like get their DNA. But I think this um, obviously it's a really high end game. This one, um, the onboarding is really nice. It's it's kind of brief and it doesn't get too in your face. Um, but oh, you can see now, look, um, you can see the, the Google Maps. So this is real-time Google Maps. So they're highlighting their unique selling points straight away, really early on. And you can see the high-quality loading screen. Uh, you can see all the future things that you haven't collected yet. And then they bundle you with a ton of stuff here. Uh, so it makes you feel like you're, you're winning immediately. So that one kind of does it all right, which goes back to the three pillars that you interject and, and swap around and chop and change, right? Open loops and narrative. Now, again, this one is kind of, um, it is a difficult one for some games. Uh, but if you recall, if you go back and watch the hybrid casual presentation I did on the channel here, um, you'll see that I covered storyline a little bit in the hybrid um, and go and check out Subway Surfers entrance, entrance, opening, where basically the guy's spraying the train and then he's running away from, from a baddie. And that's that's the story. You know, you're, you're a graffiti dude uh, doing the, the bad thing on the train and you're getting chased by a guard. And there's your storyline. So it could be really simple stuff like that. But they do add intrigue and they really are good at setting the scene of your game of letting the player where they are in your game's universe and what's happening and what's going on. So it can be as really elaborate as you like, or it can be really brief, just to, it's more context basing stuff. Um, and I think you know, that's super achievable for pretty much any game that you want. Um, they can be simple 2D, but they have to be animated. Don't just put a splash, don't do that story thing where you just show them a page and like, Oh, Johnny, da 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 da, da and that was it. Johnny the Miner. Uh, Johnny the Miner went down the mine. And that's just like really rubbish. So make sure they're animated. If you can't do it animated, I, I wouldn't bother doing it at all. Choose something else to concentrate on um, because they do look cheap and nasty, and it looks like you don't know what you're doing. Um, above all, as with all intros, um, make sure they're skippable. I think there is a stat somewhere that um, if you don't have a skippable intro, most people will bail. Um, I totally made that up, but there is a there is a stat out there. I don't have it to hand, uh, but essentially, just put a skippable button. We are looking at Merge Restaurant here. You see in the top right-hand corner, 
you got the skip ad. Um, these ones follow a similar pattern for the storyline that she's going for a new job. It looks like a fancy restaurant. She dreams of being like the star chef here, but when she gets there, it's all busted up and broken down. Um, and essentially that's the story and how it starts off, but it sets the tone and it gives context to it. Okay. Making the tutorial worthwhile, juicy and rewarding. So we know we want to make our games juicy. But as I mentioned before, um, upgrade your players immediately. This is a really, really cheap trick that you can do. And number three there, I'm just going to jump straight to it. You want to be, if you've got a character-based game and thinking, oh, I can't upgrade them straight away, da 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 you, Honestly, the best thing you can do is nerf your default state player. So say you've got your, you've got your game, you've got your, I'm going to go for runners because everyone knows what they are. Um, if you make your runner slightly worse in the tutorial part of it or the first opening level where he runs slightly slower or is slightly smaller or bigger or has a doesn't have a hat on or whatever it is, it's very hard to give an example. Go down one level there and make, make it worse for the very first onboarding tutorial no death level and just do a fake upgrade and put them back to the default straight so uh, state so immediately they feel like they've leveled up even though they really haven't but I feel more powerful I feel like I've been rewarded I'm into it I know I can level up yada 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 so uh, you definitely nerf the default state as a as a hack to ensure that your base uh your your base character or player um is the one let me rephrase that i got tangled up there you get my point you take your base level character you take them back a couple of notches for the onboarding you fake upgrade them and there you go you're all done um include uh continuous and intermittent rewards here so what do we mean by this continuous rewards are really part of the learning so i slash an enemy and get a gold coin right got it kill enemies one gold coin got it i understand the intermittent rewards are the sort of stuff that would be like a boss or for doing a bonus level or just by completing the level um, you get a kind of a reward that is not typical. And this really helps to sustain, sustain engagement. So you know that, all oh, right, if I get to level three, there's one of those things and I get I get a ton of stuff, right? So on the onboarding, make sure that you've got the continuous and intermittent reward system in place to ensure that they're learning about the game rules and being rewarded for doing actions and you're rewarding them bonuses on top for engagement. And uh, Royal Clash here from Supercell um, does a, an amazing job of this. Now, the uh, section I've highlighted here is about a minute in. We've already played a tutorial level here and essentially where we are right now is where uh, the very next thing after you've got the controls out of the way. So this is the difference between the minimal onboarding and the first time user experience. It's guiding us through. And you can see here, we're getting tons of stuff, all leveling up. And I feel like, oh, what's this? Right, that's a little, like four cards, loads of money. This is looking great. And then it takes us to show us all the cards that we can collect and then starts teaching us about the upgrading. So this does an amazing job, as you'd expect from Supercell. Um, they even add, um, I love the little animations they have on their cards to show you what the cards do as well. But yeah, this is um, this is after the first onboarding level, which is uh, really smart indeed. All right. Balance, pace, and hand holding with fun. So this is where we do the tutorials and we have a thousand arrows and we just like, oh my God, I, I don't want any homework. 
I I just I've lost the will to live and I'm out of here because it's too boring. So again, depending on how uh, complicated your game is here, you really need to think about the pacing of your game and exactly how you can weave it in to not overload the player. They won't remember everything at once. How do you uh, stagger your levels or your onboarding or your uh, tutorials to ensure that it's still fun to play, but they are learning as well we don't like i was just reading that and it's just like how else can i say it but we do not like long tutorials right we just don't um sometimes it's necessary um which is why i want to hammer the home of the hand holding pace but make it fun now coin master huge game obviously by moon uh moon active we this does really well um, you can see I'm. Uh, it does the naming here as well on this one, which I think is super smart. So again, it's mixing all of the things that we're talking about. And this is quite a long tutorial, but they really have mastered the, the fact that playing the tutorial is real fun. We're getting tons of rewards here. It's taken us through the main gameplay and the core loop of what we're doing. Uh, it's telling us to attack. So now we get to attack someone just for the hell of it. And this is still the uh, tutorial, by the way. Um, so it's a really nice pace. And you'll see here, just in a moment, is it this one? No, a bit more learning there about the shields. I think it's this next one. Let's go, come on, here we go. So you can see here, it's giving us 10 more spins. So really generous and gets us into the game, learning as we go there, making it super fun. We're building and it's teaching us. And I think this is a really good one if you've got a more complicated game to um, take some notes from, shall we say. And uh, like I said, we, uh, they, even do the, oops, they even do the naming in that as well, which is great. And peaking curiosity with goals and objectives. Short, medium, long-term goals. Try and sneak peek them as much as possible. Um, you can display stuff that's going to come available, but lock it up. Even if it's just, even if you fake it uh, on the UI for now, but you can lock it up so it, it, it shows people what they've got uh, to look forward to. Give them a taste, and it's a great opportunity to OP the player right at the start, which goes back to a lot of the points we've, we've talked about today, um, exactly what is to come. Look at this amazing thing that you can do and then roll them back to the lesser to give them the eagerness and the motivation to get to that bit where they want to use the cool stuff. And again, a little hack with the camera. We say using the camera is so powerful for all sorts of game dev um, aspects, but especially um for your for your first time user experience you can spin the camera around it just elevates everything here and we see this on royal kingdom from dream games their new one the pvp one uh, this is the first few moments of when you open this game uh, again uh, the the first time user experience typically goes on over a good few levels not that first onboarding like but there you go off your off your pop and um, they go on and hold your hand and get this pacing right. Uh, let's see where this thing um, loops at, because I want to make sure that we get it and go through this one, because I think this one's a really good example of exactly how to do this really quite well indeed. All right, so where are we here? So that should be the end of it, I think. And we start off with the game. So. Oh my goodness. All right. I want to do it. Here we go. Right. So you play the game. Typical match free onboarding with the simple thing. Really nice and juicy. Got power up straight away. Lots of juice going on here, as you'd expect. More power ups. More power ups. And you can see down the bottom, you can see all the icons that we can use locked. We get a nice celebration here, which is great. So there's the icons down the bottom, all locked. I'm like, oh, what are they? Lots of stuff happening here. 
loads of things flying about making it really juicy indeed and next up which i think is super curious here uh, great uh, level complete but look unlocks at level 32 the magic pots like what's magic pots i don't actually know what magic pots is but again we've got some arrow point in here we can see that we're now a castle district and that camera zoom there and really focusing on what the game does great, which is the graphics in this game. So I think this one's a really nice one. Uh, plenty of rewards there. So I thought that was quite a good example of, of peaking the objectives and curiosity of the player to motivate them to come back and go, oh, what was that thing? Da, 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 da. All right. So here's some key takeaways to cover. I have been talking for way too long today. That's amazing. So let's round this up. Action points and takeaways from all of this. Uh, unless your control system is like completely wild, which is probably a really terrible idea, I have to say, don't waste time explaining too much of how to control a runner. Don't just go, the, you know, you get my point here. You don't need to teach people uh, too much. Um, video games have been around for 50 years. Mobile games is like 10, 15 years right now. People kind of inherently know how to use them. Of course, if there's things that they need to learn about the game, sure, you definitely want to uh, guide them through that. But don't over-egg the controls uh, unnecessarily. Tease some of the best parts of your game coming up. Give them a chance to see what's coming early on to hook them in and motivate them to want to see what's coming next and how what they can work towards. Really powerful. Don't save all your best stuff for level 15 that half the players are never going to see. We know 25% of people typically bail just because, just because they can. So don't be afraid to front load your content a little bit. Show them up front what you've got and let them work towards it. Very, very powerful indeed. Let them feel like they're winning without doing anything. We know this from Hyper Casual. It's one of the great things that I think it's brought to the industry. It's like just really make them think that they're being powerful and winning without actually doing something. Um, rewarding them unnecessarily, I think, is typically a really good way to go. Um, build the engagement and motivate them to continue exploring your game. And that goes back to giving them some agency, showing them some stuff, um, what is coming next, let them enjoy the game. And like we saw with uh, the Homer month this month that we've done with our games, with the little level progressions, you can see what's coming up. Um, let them play through that. And if possible, try and make that emotional connection. Now, that is a difficult one, and it's kind of fluffy around the edges, but... If you've got a game where you could wrap some loose story behind it, um, that emotion is definitely achievable, uh, as well as using the character selection or the map selection or typing the name in. It's just a little peg on that emotion barometer, if you like, to build, you know, these little pieces build up to like, okay, I'll put my name in, da 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 da, -da. I've chosen my dude, um, I'm in. Let's play. And immediately you've got that. You've got you've hooked them into play. Um, give them the choices as much as you can, even if you fake it. And you can fake it in tons of different ways. Give them, uh, even if your game has linear options, throw them up a screen, a fake UI screen to have them. Do you want to, do you want to, I don't know. <laughs> do you want to go this way or that way? Do you want to choose A or B? Um, what what route should we take? Just giving them the same option all the time, or not if you can. But you know, give them that chase, and it's just like, oh, hello. So it's that curiosity, intrigue, and agency, and choice, which I think is super important. And as we saw from the Googles, get rid of any bugs. It's just not happening. Uh, you will lose players um, ridiculously fast if your game is buggy and glitchy and if you are of the attitude oh that'll do then it won't do and you need to fix it so i hope that will make sense all
I think that's it. I think I'll just repeated what I've got here. I'll leave this on the screen and we'll get to the comments now. I can't believe that was that was going to be 20 minutes I did on that. Uh, but I hope that was helpful. I will have these slides up inside the academy. Let me just uh, go over here because I can hear the comments coming in, but I can't see anyone. So let's go and have a quick look at these comments here, uh, which has, there has been a ton. Um, let's just see. So do give me a like if you like this sort of content. I'll do some more. Um, I think it's interesting to come back to this sort of stuff to figure out whether or not your game, how's your game holding up doing uh, how, how holding up against all of this sort of stuff have you even thought about showing people what's in your game have you looked at what the bigger games do are you going to try and incorporate some of this stuff and help yourself get that retention up new high score whoop whoop all right do you want to play or quit and then quit restart i shouldn't read these things out of context so um yeah i hope that was helpful today um it's kind of really interesting to see those slides with the Google uh, survey. It really is quite telling. And I think as we saw briefly uh, last week on the player archetypes, um, and you mix these, these two together, you really start to see, well, hold on. This is actually marrying up here. People want to collect stuff. And we've got the explorers over here, you know, or we've got the killers and they want to, they want to level up all their stuff. This is kind of like 30% of da, 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 da. And if you start marrying up together and perhaps that's something I will do at some point, uh, try and correlate those two together and see if we can figure some stuff out there, but it's really important. Um, I know how experienced a lot of you guys are, so that it's time to start leveling up and getting a bit more serious about what we're doing, a little bit more intentional now to try and set ourselves apart. And of course, I want to see the results inside the Homer lab when you publish your games with us and we can come and help you after the first test and stuff like that. And we'll test it for free, of course, which you already know that. But that's just another reason for taking Homer lab for a spin. So... That's going to wrap it up for me today. Like I said, do leave me a comment if you're on the replay. If you got this far, congrats. That's amazing. Uh, do like and hit the subscribe if you want to keep up to date with all of this stuff. We are back next week. And guess what? Now behave and control yourselves. So we have the CPI show next week, which is going to be super interesting. So Olek is back. I am super thrilled about that. Uh, it's very hard to nail Olek down. So I've persuaded him again to do another CPI show. Uh, we have an interesting topic, which I'm sure you will really enjoy. A really, this one, quick teaser. This is one where if you've got old prototypes, you'll definitely want to tune in next week and hear what we're going to be talking about because I think you'll find you might get some leverage from that indeed. All right. So thanks everyone for joining with me today. I am going to say goodbye for the weekend. It's a long weekend here in the UK. So if you have a long weekend, I don't know if it's just the UK, but if you do enjoy it, um, anything I need to address on the comments. Thank you everyone for all the comments here. Um, it looks like you're talking amongst yourselves. Just reading here. Tested a game with Voodoo and got 57 minutes playtime, 40% day one. But three CPI is a problem. Hamza, just go on the Discord. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that if that's legit. Um, that seems weird to me. Um, just don't want to make sure. Thank you, Jilly. Appreciate that. Thanks, Colette. Well, guys, that's it for me for now. Till next week, Olek returns CPI show. Come and join me on the Discord. Come and test your games with Homer and come inside the Academy where you'll find this presentation and all the previous presentations available for you to browse and download and all that good stuff. So with all that said and done, that is going to wrap it up for me for now. Thank you, everybody. Take care. I will see you next week. And uh, yeah, happy Friday and see you soon.
Tada!